All right, so to cover some stuff that we went over in class, uh, some of the stuff is miscellaneous, and this is one of those sections. So for people using Google Chrome, I'm going to show you kind of how to optimize it and some recommended configurations and settings. So one thing, if you ever look at Google Chrome and you go to the background pages, the more of these extensions that you enable, the more Google is going to start eating up processing power. And so whenever you look under here, you see that here is the main Google Chrome that's running. But if I scroll down, you'll see you'll also see all of this stuff. This is a combination of two things. It's a combination of these background pages that are running, and it's also the plugins. And it's pretty hard to reach this thing, so I usually just type in this address right there. And if you type that in, it'll show you all your plugins that you're running. In order to make Google Chrome run more effectively, the first thing you need to do is disable one of the two or both, but I don't really recommend that. Uh, one of the versions of uh, Flash that's running. The first one, which is called Pepper Flash, is the Google Chrome port of um, Flash. And I disable that one. The second one is the system installed Flash. So you can see that it's going to my system rather than going into the Google Chrome subfolder. And this should be the same on Windows or Mac, just the addresses will be different. But the ones called Pepper Flash, disable that one. As of right now, Adobe Flash can be set to auto update so that it runs in the background updates itself rather than uh, consistently annoying you. Except on Mac, which has some restrictive permissions as far as that goes, it'll still pop up. Next up, if you scroll down, you're going to eventually hit Java. And I highly recommend you disable that. And that's because Java has had numerous security flaws over the past six months, which Oracle has not fixed even as of this recording. And so even the Department of Homeland Security recommended that you disable Java inside of your browser. Scroll all the way down, disable it. Very few websites now use Java applets. So it's not going to cause you very many problems if you disable it. And you can run through here and look at some of the other stuff and disable that as you please. Now the extensions that I do run, I recommend everyone run them. The first one's LastPass and all that does is that it automatically generates encrypted, you know, really long passwords for you and stores them in a secure storage, uh, a secure storage cloud that automatically encrypts and remembers your passwords. The next one is called Web of Trust, and what Web of Trust does is that it's a user um, rating system, and people go to websites and rate the content of whether or not it's safe. So spoof websites, phishing websites, a lot of unsafe content on the web that people click on. You'll see this bar turn to red if you go to one of those types of websites. Yellow means that some people aren't sure about it and green means that the community generally recognizes that it's safe and of course when you see this sort of color it means it's something that no one could visit because this is my local Chrome extensions page. After that there is do not track me. What that does is exactly what it says. There's a lot of websites that track what you do, where you go and then sell that information to advertising companies. I'm not a huge fan of the idea of my information being sold without me receiving monetary compensation so I don't allow people to track me. And then last up is what's called KB SSL Enforcer for Chrome. And what that does is it allows you to, well, by default when you now visit any websites, if you go to Google, it automatically encrypts the connection. Now doing this on your home computer isn't really that necessary, but anytime you're using an open wireless connection, if it's not encrypted like at most coffee shops or airports or a lot of other places, hotels, uh, all of your information as it's being entered is being tracked. So your Facebook login, your Twitter ID, your credit card information if you use a credit card, all of that gets put to where anyone can capture it and use it to uh, steal your information. So identity theft. So this encrypts the connection if you're on an unsecure connection or a secure connection. And that just means that people can't see what you're doing online. And I think that's obviously uh, a big plus. So those are the extensions that I use, and those are the plugins that I use and why I disable them. Disabling Java and one version of Flash just makes Google Chrome a much more steady uh, application, and it reduces the overhead bloat of it. Because Google Chrome, the way it works is it uh, tries to bundle everything inside of it, so it tries to auto-update everything. And because it bundles so much inside of it, it is actually one of the larger browsers. And the way they get around that, when you look at the task manager, is they do something called threading. 
And so they run several different instances of Google Chrome, each of which is doing one thing. So if one thing crashes, so I can go here and I can go to my background pages, I can start crashing it on purpose. So I can say in process. And you'll see that Google still runs fine. Only thing that happens is KBSSL crashes. And if I do it to LastPass, LastPass will crash. But, and, and the uh, memory use overall will go down. But Google Chrome still works. If you don't do this sort of hyper-threading that it does, then what happens is if one of these uh, applications crashes, your entire browser crashes. And so that's why Google Chrome does that. They consider it a plus. Um, but individual results may vary. Now what I'm going to show you how to do is to use Dreamweaver. Now Derek isn't covering Dreamweaver because a lot of the functionality of Dreamweaver has become obsolete over the web. So the big thing that you used to do in Dreamweaver is you used to create websites, so they say create a new, well that's really not even the best way to start. The way you really should be starting off with Dreamweaver before you do anything is go to site, go to new site, and then under here, so I'll call it test site, and then for my local folder, I'm going to be inside my HT docs. I'm running a local server on my web page or on my, uh, excuse me, on my computer, but you can put this wherever. Go there and select it, and in my case, I'll call it test site. New folder. It'll actually automatically create it, but I'm going to do it anyway, just because. Select that. Now I have a test site, then go to servers, hit plus change it to being a local network because I'm just running this on my own web page. Select it and in my case I'm actually running multiple servers so I have to specify which port I'm using but then I'll call it test site and then under uh, I'll call this Apache PHP then under advanced for the server model, set it to being a PHP MySQL website. Save it and then change it from a remote website, which means I'd be connecting to my host remotely and to a test website, because that's all I'm using that for. Sadly, uh, this is one of the things they improved a lot in CS5, actually. They knocked out a lot of the clutter that was getting this. One of the things I don't like is for version control, they only give you the option of subversion. I prefer Git uh, much more than subversion, which I'll show you how to use that sometime in the future. It's it's both advanced and probably one of the greatest things you'll ever find once you really learn how Git works. But that's all you need is to set up, really you just need to set up this port. Uh, setting up this stuff is only good if you're actually planning on doing PHP programming. So now I have a site defined. And now if I create a new PHP file, you'll see what I get. And what's nice about Dreamweaver is it automatically gives me everything that I need. So my meta car set, my title, my head. I have a basic blank starting document. Now by default Dreamweaver doesn't start you with HTML5, it still uses uh, XHTML as the default which is not not cool with me. To change that go to your preferences, go to new document and then for default document type your DTD, the thing you put up here, change that to HTML5 and then everything else can pretty much be the same and say okay and now you have a blank document. Now here I'm in split view one of the things that I like about Dreamweaver is that it has a bunch of pre-configured um, uh, common web layouts and also it has tablet and smartphones. Now these are all based upon pretty much the iPhone and so an iPad for the tablet and so as Android has caught up there is a vastly greater number of screen resolutions that you have to support. So one of the ways that I commonly did website development for mobile sites is now considered a little more deprecated. But you can also go down here to edit size and add your own custom sizes to it if you want. You can also switch the orientation of it if you so desire. So right here's my title and I'll call it test website. And so first let's see if our PHP is working. And so to do that we add this and that says that everything enclosed between here and here is going to be a PHP and the most basic PHP command is this PHP info and this gives you access to everything your um, all of your configuration settings for PHP so now if I switch to live view and I'll call this index.php save it you can see that what I get is a live link between my PHP command 
and my Dreamweaver website. So this is one of the other standout features of Dreamweaver was the ability to do this because there's no other IDE that I know of that's actually able to do this correctly. And so then if I run through this, it gives me everything that you could ever want to know about how my PHP is configured. And if I turn it off, I get rid of it. And if I go into live code, it shows me actually what this is, and it gives me a live preview of what the PHP is generating. So that one little PHP tag gives me all of this. I can even go into inspect mode and click around. And so this tells me where my INI file is, which is what defines everything that you're doing inside of PHP. Now, and like what compiler was used. Now, one of the things that has made this deprecated is the invention of the inspect element. Originally, the only way you could get this was with a plugin in Firefox called Firebug. But all of the uh, WebKit browsers like Chrome and uh, Safari, they have this built in automatically. I prefer uh, Chrome for one reason, and that is they still have the view page source. They ripped that out of, you can see this is what it used to look like whenever you used to use doc type declarations. You used to have to put all this in and declare this, and then you had to put in this tag. And so this was a pain to remember, and no one ever could, so most we just copy and pasted it. This little piece right here is a lot easier to remember. This is for HTML5. This is the old XHTML standard. You can see it's transitional. No one ever remembered this. Um, but if we go back here and we inspect our elements, I can go in here, click, and so on this file, let's say I want to change it. So first of all, I can change this and say, I am awesome. And so this is one reason why you shouldn't trust uh, <laughs> everything you see on the web, because you can now see how easy it is that I could do a fake uh, list of information for someone on the web and take a screenshot and say, up, oh, look what I did. It's their web page. Here it is on the site thing, but it's saying stuff. But if I wanted to change the background color, for example, double click. Come on. It's actually double, it's actually clicking down here. Background color pound zero FF. And when I do that, I get this super highlighted blue color. So because the browser itself is now a development environment, which wasn't true previously, that's another thing that Dreamweaver has lost out on. But the advantage of Dreamweaver is that you can make these changes and actually save them. Whereas here, if I make a lot of changes to this file, then I have to remember where I made this change and where I made this change inside of here. And if I keep doing a lot of changes, as soon as I hit reload, all those changes are gone. So that's uh, one advantage of Dreamer, but that's also one reason why it's fallen out of favor is because now that I can use my browser for so much development and debugging, I don't really need Dreamweaver to do it for me. And plus, these features were added a little bit too late. These didn't come until CS4, CS5, somewhere around then, and Firebug has existed for quite a while now. All right. And then if I get rid of this tag and then click and save my changes, you'll see now there's nothing there. And if I go into live code, all I get is my basic uh, web page. So there's two ways to work inside a Dreamweaver. And the first way is to work inside of this, which is uh, the code view. And here, whenever I enter something, you know, when I click off over here and save my changes, it updates over here. To notice that you'll notice as I'm clicking around here, I'm not actually able to change it over here in the design view. That's because I'm in live mute, uh, live mode right now. If I turn off live mode, then I can code without having to use the code view. And whenever I did that, you see that PHP automatically understood that as soon as I hit enter, I wanted a paragraph, and if I hit shift enter. You can see that it automatically added it. Now note something here, and this is what I was talking about to Derek about. Inside of the actual HTML spec, you do not have to have this line here. This is something from XML, and essentially what XML says is that if you have a single line of code, something that doesn't require a closing tag, then the way you close it is you just add this slash within the same line, and that signifies the end of it. Inside of HTML5, 
either be or or that are both completely valid. It is generally recommended though that you still use this, at least for right now, this won't be true probably in a year or two, but only because someone who's using a really, really old browser, they will not have problems when they run across it. But in any modern browser, it understands this tag just fine. Now, the next thing that uh, Dreamweaver gives you is it gives you a sort of hidden function where under window results and this reference. This is one of the most useful things that Dreamweaver actually has, but is often hidden and obscured. And I don't know why you would ever want to obscure this. But under here, under reference, it enables you to look at the O'Reilly pocket reference books. And now, if I want to know what something does, I have a list here of all the different uh, HTML elements. And when I click on them, I get defined what all the different heading tags are, what they actually do, and then which browsers are supported. And so it's in, it's in all the versions of browser and everything else. And then it gives you an example of how to use it. And if you're using JavaScript and you want to grab this, then it gives you the DOM, the document object model, and how you actually get to it. And then specific things to it. So in this case, the align tag, if I go to uh, description, tells me what that does. Now, of course, this is deprecated, and some of these references are a little bit outdated. But it basically shows you what you know aligning it does. So here, if I copied the code, and I said, H1 align equals center. I can see that my tag has been centered on the web page. I can also look and see if I wanted to change the language, then I could do that right here as well. So if I was doing something in um, Dutch, then I could use that tag. Now, of course, this is deprecated, and the reason why, when you read the spec, is that it tells you that HTML is meant to be strictly regarding either uh, structural presentation. So what this H1 really means isn't that this tag should be big. It really means that when a search engine looks at this, my heading tag is the most important thing that I am saying on the web page. So in this case, the most important thing is that this is my test page. <laughs> and in this case, this uh, kind of bland uh, element here is what is most important. And so the way I would do this, if I wanted to have a CSS rule, you click the little plus icon here and it gives you the CSS selector. In this case, I do want a class. And the name of my class is going to be center text. It'll be here under block, but where it has text align, I just hit center and apply. And now under my style sheet, I now have this new thing called center text. And now when I click on something, I go to the properties here where it has class, I click on it and I see center text. And Dreamweaver will um, give me a visual preview of whatever it is I do. So if I click this now, I now have a reusable piece of code. And that's the reason why you're strongly encouraged to use CSS, is because it makes your web pages smaller, so rather than having to keep entering in um, p align equals center text, I can now just reuse this class as many times as I need to to do that. And if I wanted to add more properties to it, I could go here and say maybe I want to make the background a light gray and let's see text transform make it all uppercase so now whenever I use this I'm making this little heading here really stick out and now if I look at my classes when I look at the center text I can see that it's got the background and that it centers the text now, an important thing to know about web pages, which I'm going to end this recording pretty soon, but one of the things that's important to know about web design is that there's two basic types of elements. And one type of element is what's known as a inline element, and the other type of element is known as a block level element. So if I use a span tag and I say span class equals red, Then I close out my span tag. When I go here to my PHP, 
if I have my cursor inside of wherever it is that I'm going to be using the code and I click the plus icon, it already knows that I want to use a class and it's going to be the class of red because that's how I defined it. So I say OK. And then here of course where it has color, I'm going to click and grab my red color and apply it. And now you can see that it applied this line of code, but there's no breaks around it. There's no margin padding. A block level element will, let me inspect the element and show you this a little better. Any block level elements, when you look at them, come with a default set of margin and a default set of padding around them. And inside of the inspector, if I scroll down here, you'll see what Google Chrome does by default. It displays as a block. Here is the font size. It's two M's. And then here's the margin. And it has the dash web kit because this is uh, Chrome and Safari's defaults. Now Firefox and Internet Explorer have different defaults than this. And that's the whole purpose behind the CSS resets. So what they do is they eliminate all the margin and padding and a couple other things from every single element where it would be different. The downside to a CSS reset, and one reason why I don't really recommend using them very much, is because they can go too far. If you remove all the default stuff, so let's say I go in and I'll use what used to be known as the nuclear option very dramatically. But let's say inside of my text CSS I say star, and then I say padding zero, margin zero. Save that. And now, whenever I refresh my browser, you'll see that everything gets pushed up to the top. And now when I look at this is my tag, you're seeing there's no more of those little yellow lines denoting the margin break. Now the only space that I have is the space right here, which is given to me by this empty P tag. If I delete that node, you'll see what happens is that my H1 starts shoving up really close to the top here. And that may be desirable, that may not be. But if you do this uh, in order to prevent things from getting jammed together, then you need to go back in there and re-add in all the different spacing. And so that's uh, what a block level element is. It takes up everything. And you can actually change that. So I can set this to display inline. That was the P style. I didn't really want that to be displayed inline. It's this I want to display inline display inline. And now you're seeing what happened. It's taken this block level element and it's now made an inline element so now rather than being separated by itself and pushing everything else away it's now inside of its own area. The other way to deal with that more commonly than trying to change an element is to set a width and height. So width of let's say eh, 300 pixels and then a height of 100 pixels and then margin equals auto and what that does is that it takes it calculates the left margin and the right margin and makes them equal which has the result of centering any block level elements so this is how in CSS if you want to center some rather than saying the old way which was to use a tag in the oldie days you used to use something called the center tag It's not going to have any effects because I haven't changed this yet. So if I go here into center text, oops, double click on center text instead, and I go here to my box model and give it a width of 200 pixels and a height of 100 pixels, hit apply to get a live preview, and that'll show what that looks like. Now, the center tag should change that, but I'm not even sure if that'll work in HTML5. Let's see if it does. Yeah, it still works in HTML5. And that's not because HTML5 allows it to be valid, because you're seeing the Dreamweaver is saying a no-go. I'll have to put into Live View probably to make it work. Yeah, there it goes. But that's that works only because browsers still support a lot of deprecated elements. So Once it eventually goes there, It'll tell you stuff like on your IMG tags, you should not be specifying a border around stuff. You should be using CSS. There used to be a whole list of stuff. Here they are. 
So here's a whole list of HTML tags that used to be available, but they now no longer uh, allow them. Pretty much all this stuff, oh, except for Blink. Blink used to be annoying. But all this stuff, um, pretty much it's using HTML to create styling. And nowadays, cascading style sheets, as the name implies, is what you should be using. So hopefully that clarified a few things for you. And I'll be posting these sorts of tutorials as I go through class and as more problems come up and appear.